Welcome to another episode of Sports and Songs Podcast. Today is April 24th, 2021. Uh, we are your co-hosts, Dan and Andy. Today's uh, season two, episode 22. How are you doing, Andy? I'm good. I'm good. How about yourself? Good. <clears throat> We've got some good things to cover. A lot of, lot of sports, a lot of fun things here going on. Uh, bad weather this weekend. It's going to be kind of rainy, drizzly, and cold, but lots of things on television. Yes, not quite high school playoff format stuff, but lots of fun sports on TV. Before I start my rambling, do you have a trivia question, sir? The trivia question this week relates to the FCS football to a certain conference called the SWAC, the Southwestern Athletic Conference. It's played in the South, almost the deep South, uh, very football heavy teams play in this conference. And uh, they have a 10 team conference, five teams in the West, five teams in the East. And at the end of the season, top team of each plays each other for the championship, much like the big 10 does uh, uh, that they've adopted here in the last 10 years. Uh, so the question is in the East division, <clears throat> Alcorn state will not be playing this year in the East uh, championship. <clears throat> they've won it. They've been the dynasty in that division due to COVID they took the year off, but they won the East six straight seasons and played in the championship game. So the question for the week is who will be playing in the championship game representing the East division this year? Elkhorn state, like I said, has been there the last, it's basically hasn't been anyone the last seven years because they had last year off due to COVID. So this team that got in there now will be playing for the first time representing the East, other than Alcorn State for the first time in seven years? That's the question. Kind of like the Bison of the South. It's like that. Oh, very good. Yeah, they're tough, tough, tough stuff. And I'm guessing that many of the listeners of this show is not, are not going to know this or even have an interest in this. But uh, it'll be interesting when we go cover some more stuff later in the show. It'll tie back. So that's yep. all. All right. I'll just start with my happy-go-lucky stuff here. First off, NASCAR, we'll jump right in the NASCAR stuff right off the bat. Talladega this weekend, um, the Geico 500, uh, 1 p.m. on Fox. Uh, one little fact they'll probably bring up during the, the race today. First of all, Talladega is always a fun track to watch. Um, nice, good racing there all the time. Very exciting. Uh, with Clint Boyer now, now in the announced track, or now in the announced booth, not racing anymore, it was kind of taught to him because he's been there more recently than Jeff Gordon. But the closest margin of victory ever at Talladega was April 17th, 2011, where Jimmy Johnson beat Clint Boyer by .002 seconds. Jeez. So I'm sure Jeff Gordon would give him a hard time on that. And Clint's a pretty funny guy, so I'd like to see how he kind of rebuttals that or gives him a hard time. Um, but it's always good to hear that. And Jeff Gordon's been in, but he's been removed a few years now. Clint's been there a little more recently. Um, it's kind of nice to hear their, their banter back and forth. Uh, NASCAR fans know those two have had issues in the past. But then they've kind of buried it for TV reasons and financial reasons. But yeah, they're good banter. Jeff Gordon's okay on the track. The thing I respect about Jeff Gordon, when I first heard him going to announcing, I thought, oh, great. Here we go. Pretty boy up there doing the announcing, whatever. He's actually pretty knowledgeable. <clears throat> so I give him that. Uh, but give him a shout or a listen this weekend, uh, 1 o'clock on your Fox station. Moving on, some, some gopher news. Gopher Gymnastics ended their season. But Lily, or Lexi Ramler um, from St. Michael, Minnesota, was the 2021 AAI Award winner. Now you're sitting there going, Andy, what's AAI Award winner? Let me tell you. It honors the most outstanding senior gymnast in the nation. So it's kind of like MVP for seniors. So congratulations to her. A lot of the girls' gophers had a really good season this year. Um, very exciting to watch them, and they should be good next year, too, to follow. Moving on, NCAA. I got some NCAA stuff here. First of all, um, college football wants to change their overtime rule. Uh, what the rule is now is each team gets one. Well, they start with the ball to 25, and you go, I think it's after two or three times, you always have to go for a two-point conversion. There was one game a couple years ago, ended like 73 to 71. They went like seven overtimes. NCAA wants to change that for football. We're after two possessions each. If you're still tied, 
all you do is run two point conversions. So A, yeah, it may go faster. You won't see a 71 to 73 game anymore. And if you do, oh my God, how many overtimes would they go? But then they're trying to prevent that number of overtimes. The five, six overtimes are so rare anyway, I don't get it. I don't know if it's a health and safety thing. Um, but we'll see. A lot of teams are against it, but again, how many times you go to that third overtime? So I wouldn't worry about it too, too much if I was a big fan. Um, also, a little more uh, NCAA news, basketball. Uh, Chet Holmgren from Minnehaha Academy was uh, nationally the number one prospect going to college. Uh, he decided to go to Gonzaga, where former classmate teammate is Jalen Shuggs one. Jalen's going pro, so those two won't get a chance to play each other. And some of the listeners are probably going, Holmgren, there's a good Minnesota Scandinavian name. I recognize that name. Well, yeah, his dad, Dave, played for Prior Lake back in the day. I'm not going to age him Back in the day. I believe he went under the Gophers for a few years after that. So uh, Prior Lake alum Dave Holmgren and his son, Chet, who went to Minnehaha Academy, going on to Gonzaga next year. Um, big kid's got a big, big, bright future. Like most kids going to college, just stay healthy and don't do anything stupid. Um, baseball, go for baseball news. Uh, there's a picture of Lucas Gilbreth of the Gophers. He got called up this week to the Colorado Rockies for a, a weekend. Uh, they had doubleheader. The way Major League Baseball goes, doubleheaders, yeah, they're seven inning games each. But you can call an extra guy up. So he did. They called up the ex-Gopher for the doubleheader against the Mets. He did not get in to play the game, but he was there. He, this makes him the 37th Gopher to reach the major leagues. Um, and he went to high school in Colorado, so kind of playing for the hometown team a little bit there. So he got his, he got his ups, kind of got some of the butterflies out. I wish he could have got an ending in, just kind of get that out of the way. But congratulations still, you got to call up anyway. That That's saying something, you know, so congrats to him for that. Uh, last year's number three pick, there is Max Meyer from Woodbury. Uh, again, like when he was picked third last year, that ties Paul Molitor for highest pick ever for a gopher player. Uh, Max is still in the Miami Marlins organization. He's uh, sitting by double A again this year. Uh, last year's COVID and missing things up. Uh, I don't want to say it stunted his progression up, but they might have helped him in a way a little bit. It wasn't so rushed and everything else. One thing for Max, you always hear some pitchers coming in. Oh, this guy, he used to be a shortstop or a shortstop who used to be a pitcher. Max did play outfield when he was with the Gophers, so he always has that to fall back on. Um, Miami being a good young team, I won't be surprised if you see Mr. Max up in the next couple of years or so, but uh, continued good luck and success to him. The local boy does good. That's always fun to see. Let's get into the important things here, the Mets. Mets pitching staff, like I said before, has just had issues. Uh, the Cubs took care of them over the week. That wasn't very good. Mets came back last night with a nice performance by DeGrom. Um, a two-hitter, complete game, 15 strikeouts. DeGrom, again, like I said, last week had a game where he had nine straight strikeouts. You don't see that very often anymore. He's just on a roll. Let's just, some of the numbers for the Mets pitchers this year. Stroman's 3-0 and in three starts, the .9 ERA, 11 strikeouts, three Ks. DeGrom, including last night's game, 2-1. and one, Four starts, a .31 ERA with the one complete game. In 29 innings pitched, he's got 50 strikeouts already and only walked three. And uh, they got David Patterson, who's one and two, uh, 6.75 ERA and three starts, uh, 18 Ks and just over 13 innings. And then Tejan Walker's 0-1, uh, three starts, 19 Ks and 14 innings pitched. His downfall is he's given up 11 walks. He could have had a blow-up ending there against the Cubs. Things didn't go out so well for him. But getting back to DeGrom's numbers, batting. Last night in the game, he batted eighth. Uh, he's For the season, he's 6 for 11, batting 545, with a double and two RBIs, and only struck out twice. Let's compare that to Miguel Sano of the Twins, the DH, who they pay big money for just to hit. 
He's five for 45 with a 111 batting average, 20 strikeouts, and only four RBIs. Let the pitchers bat, get rid of the DH. It's another show for another day. Uh, more Mets news. Syndergaard, Syndergaard is still due for a mid-June call-up. He's uh, sitting okay on that. He's um, coming well through half from Tommy John. Uh, Carlos Carrasco, or Cookie, the other pitcher that got in the Francisco Lindor deal with the Indians. He had a torn right hamstring in training camp. Uh, he's still – that was back in mid-March. He starts throwing this week. What the Mets front office is saying, and I kind of like the way they say this, they're playing it safe because the media is the media. They're not giving an ETA right now. They said, let him start throwing again, and then we'll see from there. So there's a little speculation there. We'll go from that. And then Seth Lugo, who had elbow surgery early spring, he's expected for a May return as well. So good for him on that one. Um, that should be kind of exciting to see him all come back on that stuff. Uh, Major League Baseball's ratings are up. Uh, now this is over a 20-year history, not just compared to last year. They're saying their ratings are up. This is kind of like my personal of the week is the fans for coming back to sports finally. Um, so this midweek uh, shows uh, Major League Baseball's most watched 18-day period as 20-year season history. So they're coming back. Now, some other sports like basketball is saying, oh, our viewership's up 34% from last year. Okay, that was in the bubble. That's not an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. Baseball's playing over 20 seasons, so they have a longer stretch here. If basketball could say, hey, in the last 20 years, viewership's up, I'll give you that. But when you compare it to last year in the bubble, that's not the same thing, basketball. You're, you're just delusional. You don't know what you're talking about. You're a bunch of fools. Um, you get my soapbox here and you can listen to me on this cause I'm right. There's my soapbox. Re the topic of my soapbox this week is the rock and roll hall of fame. Just it's, I think it's official name is the rock and roll hall of fame museum. Just keep it the rock and roll museum. Um, a few years ago, Paul Stanley went off on it from kiss how that's not truly a hall of fame. Lots of other artists in it or not in it. If they're bitter or not, don't think it's a true Hall of Fame. They have a group of like 500 people who call themselves music enthusiasts or music experts, rock experts, who get to pick who gets to be in there and who doesn't. A lot of it also has to do from, uh, it's kind of like getting your star in a Hollywood Walk of Fame. Did your fan club cut a check? Does your fan club write a bunch of support letters? Okay, now you're a popularity contest, not a Hall of Fame. You're an all-star game, not a Hall of Fame when you're based on office, stuff like that. Now, here's a list of some people who are not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, where if you're truly saying you're a Hall of Fame for rock and roll, these names should be in there. And I, these are not in any order. They're in alphabetical order, so it's not like worst or first. People who aren't in that should be. Bad Company, Barry White, Billy Idol. The Commodores are not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Duran Duran, the Rhythmics, the Guess Who. Jan and Dean, Judas Priest, The Monkees, Ozzy Osbourne is not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Pat Benatar, The Replacements, The Spinners, Tommy James and The Shondells, Warren Zvon, Weird Al's not even in the Hall of Fame. Now, some of this year's nominees are people that should have been already in, but they're just nominees now this year. The Go-Go's, Iron Maiden, The New York Dolls, Dionne Warwick, and Tina Turner. You call yourself a Hall of Fame without Tina Turner in there? Embarrassing. You guys are just embarrassing. I just, oh, but, you know, because of that, I knew I'd get on a rant. I kind of want to backtrack to some good news. I want to get some good stuff to end it. I always kind of end it on my rant. No, no. Go back to good news. Major League Baseball standings. Um, these are kind of an expanded standing from MLB site. I know it's early in the year. But us stat geeks get off on this stuff, so follow with me here. The AL East, you see Boston in first, Tampa two and a half behind it. You go, well, what's this number here? That's wild card games behind. So in the wild card race, Tampa's a half game out. Um, there you got the Yankees at eight and eleven. Twins not doing well. Here's the sad part. Everybody's happy. Yeah, the Yanks are eight and eleven. Yay, they're doing terrible. Twins are doing worse than them. So kind of like kissing your sister there. 
Uh, the Twins hopefully can come back if they get a few things straightened off. Be good. Kansas City in first place. I don't know. Is it smoke and mirrors? Are they for real? I don't know. Um, we'll see. We'll see. Kansas City is going to kind of sneak up on us this year. Detroit, of course, doing what they're supposed to do at 713. In the West, kind of like we've mentioned in the – or I've mentioned in the past, Dan and I have talked about, you look at the A's, a 12-game winning streak. That's great. 12-game winning streak, play 500 the rest of the year, you're the favorites to win. Uh, they want to keep going more, wonderful. Seattle's doing good. They're 6-4 and four in the last 10 games. They had a nice winning streak there. And they're a game out because the A's have just powered right on through. So that's that part. We'll go to uh, the National League here. I really, uh, I guess Milwaukee, 11 and 8, but I don't think they've been doing that good to be 11 and 8. So um, we'll see if they can hold up. Cubs, 10 and 9. You can thank the Mets for giving them the three wins there. Cincinnati is a team I'm kind of watching a little bit this year. I, Cincinnati would, is going to be a surprise this year, I think. They're going to be in that fight all year long, I think. Maybe a wild card team. You got the West there. You got the Dodgers doing well. San Francisco, San Diego. That's it. I'm going to backtrack here to the Mets. They are in first, eight and seven. Everybody else in the division is below 500. They said this would be a tough division this year. I didn't think they mean tough by all five teams around 500. So, um, still close, just not as good as a lot of people thought it would be. Um, and then music events coming up this weekend. Our friends at Medina, you got Shayla Lee tonight. Uh, the 70s Magic Sunshine Band, Friday. And then starting Thursdays from 6 to 9 at Medina, they have uh, music on the patio, free. So if you're out there on a Thursday night, go dinner, check out afterwards. You got the Jurgensons coming up. Uh, there's Bad Girlfriend playing Inside Friday. Uh, Shane Martin's going to be there. Uh, the Michael Paul duo is going to be there on Tuesday. So check all those out. Medina. There, they always put on a good job, good show there. Good food at Roberts ahead of time. Do your thing there. Um, like I said, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction is coming up. I'm not a big fan of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I'm more of a fan of the museum part of it. It's more popularity contest, kind of an all-star game. Can you just imagine if the NFL and Major League Baseball let the fans decide who's in the Hall of Fame? Wow. That's my uh, few minutes of fame for today, sir. Um, I did mention on Friday on Instagram, I had a special about FCS football in the playoffs. I did not know Dan's trivia question when I did it, so go back to your trivia answer, sir. Well, let me um, – I have a piece on that uh, Hall of Fame as well. I'm not, a, I'm not a big fan, much like you are, Andy. Uh, Major League Baseball – NFL football, to me, seems like an official Hall of Fame. Uh, experts yep. decide on it. Now, in music, there was no such thing as a Hall of Fame. So I give them credit for, for trying to get one out there, but it wasn't their best shot, and they did it kind of wrong. Uh, and so you hear all these complaints about it. I'm not a fan myself. Now, I am planning to go there this year in Cleveland to the Hall of Fame sometime this summer on a trip and I want to come back uh, with a review of it. I got a feeling the museum part of it is going to be awesome. And it's going to be Having great. Having one a couple years ago, yeah. And I think, uh, like you, uh, it should be called uh, a great place for a museum. I also believe that in rock and roll music should have a Hall of Fame. But the way they're doing this here is, like you said, I agree. It's it's rather goofy. It's, it's more of a popularity contest. And that's... Not the point. Uh, if Major League Baseball had that, you'd, you'd see Mark the Bird Fidrich in the Hall of Fame. Right, exactly. Yeah. The chicken would be in the Hall of Fame. Numbers, whether you like them or not, who has a quality of stats? Music industry records all this. You've got the number of album sales in all the different countries, how far they've reached on the billboard charts, how much money that has come in, uh, how much they've meant <clears throat> to the music industry. You can certainly uh, put all those things in statistics to reach that yep. level. But right now they're picking them based on popularity. And so you yeah. get some people that are in there that shouldn't be and people that aren't that should be. And it's gotten to be kind of comical over the years. But <clears throat> because yeah, of Kiss album sales for Kiss over the years. 
and they finally got in like four years ago. <clears throat> Album sales. Oh, I think with with Kiss, they also got in because they kind of got nudged to be in. Uh, but Kiss was very anti Hall of Fame from the very beginning, and the group that founded the Hall of Fames kind of came out and said that, "Well, good luck. We're never going to let a band like Kiss in the Hall of Fame." And they yeah. kind of came out and almost said that on purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's kind of a goofy thing, but I I do look forward to going there, seeing the museum part, and coming back with a little bit of of a review. But uh, it is interesting. Now, FCS football. Yep. Andy did his <clears throat> show on it in the midweek show. The NCAA brackets are out there. Yep. You can actually print off the brackets. It's a single elimination tournament. There's no other football going on this time of year except for that. And of all the teams in the FCS championship uh, in, in the in that division, they're all done. There's, there's 16 teams left playing. 10 outright won their league or their conference. And so they get an automatic a bid and maybe you covered this on your show and the remaining six teams were at large so the 16 teams left now what i wanted to cover today is people say what do you mean 10 10 leagues the, the champions got in there's 13 leagues in fcs football what about the other three well due to covid the ivy league backed out the ivy league scratched and says we're not going to even play a season much less be involved in the postseason tournament. The MEAC, the M-E-A-C conference, same thing. They, they, they didn't even play this year. So that leaves one more league, the SWAC, which I talked about in the trivia. The Southwest Athletic Conference did play during COVID in the spring, but they opted out of the postseason Sweet 16 tournament, I'll call it, the Sweet 16. Yeah. So they're still playing. So there's really 18 teams as of right now still left active in FCS. And SWAC, what I mentioned also in the uh, trivia question is they play their games at East Division, West Division. West. The best team from each plays each other for the SWAC title. It's kind of a, a bragging rights for this division to come home with that title. Even more so that, and I'm not sure about this, maybe Andy, you could elaborate, but it's it means so much to them. They opted out of the of the tournament to play their own deal. Is that correct? Is that uh, what they Yeah, that, they that's last I heard. Yeah. Okay. So they've got this, they've got a tournament, <clears throat> not a tournament. It's a single game, which is May 1st, a week from today. And uh, that's a pretty big deal. They, uh, they're going to be playing it at a neutral site, winner take all. They get the trophy and uh, it's a huge deal there for the SWAC division. So let me, uh, so what, like I said, Alcorn State didn't make it in there. The teams that made it, <clears throat> Arkansas Pine Bluff and Alabama A&M. So Alabama A&M, the answer to the trivia question, Alcorn State won the East seven of the last six straight years. And they didn't hold the division last year. Alcorn State opted out of the season after trying to have some scheduling. That scheduling didn't work. They had some conflicts with COVID. They said, we're done. They're going to opt out of the whole season. Due to COVID pandemic, Alcorn State said, we'll throw it in. The article that came out January of this year, the preseason rankings for the SWAC division for the whole conference, Alcorn State was picked to win it. You know, the seniors all excited for the season. <clears throat> the team was the number one seed to win the whole thing this year. They opted out. So now we're going to get some fresh blood. Alabama A&M wins their division without Alcorn State in there. They're going to the title game. Once again, that's May 1st on ESPN2, I believe. And the top two teams in there, both pretty good passing offenses that score. They both teams average 35 points a game. So I may even watch that SWAC. I've never watched the SWAC tournament championship game ever, but May 1st, I may, I may tune in, Andy, for that. Well, and that's the, the bad rap that the FCS gets is everybody assumes it's like the old school days where it's just option football. They don't play real, they don't play real football. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. These guys are uh, good players. They're good enough to, for a college to say, we'll pay for your education to come play here. FCS, to the last couple of years, doesn't get the big TV money. They don't get all the big stuff like this. So these guys are playing ball. Um, they don't just run the option all the time. Yeah, there's a lot of quarterback draws, but you know what? Hi, welcome to the modern-day NFL for some teams. So it's not that big a stretch. 
I don't know. I haven't heard yet for a lot of these guys for Alcorn State. Can they come back again next year? Because, you know, some sports extended – kids could get another year of eligibility because the, the sport was I think, done. I think that will be the case. But still, yeah. it's, uh, it's, a, it's a tough deal because they were picked number one. They practiced. Yeah. They still had the offseason, the, the spring, the workouts and everything else to prepare. They even had games on the schedule and then yeah. later canceled the whole season. Now, if you go to their football page, <clears throat> they did a big announcement for the 2021 fall season that they're all hyped about and excited about which makes sense, but <clears throat> boy, they were the number one favored team in that whole conference uh, this year and then elected to opt out. So that's a, that's a tough shout for them. And like you said, there's some talent on these FCS teams and these players yeah. are good. You see a handful of them drafted in the NFL, uh, some, some good football down there. Now the brackets, <clears throat> one thing I liked about the brackets is April 18th, they do an actual selection show. Yep. announcing the teams that make it it's single elimination they play 16 teams are in it today scattered from 11 o'clock start to 6 p.m uh, all the way through the day uh, with staggered starts it's almost like an ncaa basketball yep. round games games are going on all day long espn3 i think is carrying most of the games single elimination you you lose you're done you go home now the next week on may 1st is the Elite Eight games. Once again, you lose, you go home. Winners go to the Final Four, we can call it. Yep. Uh, those games will be played May 8th, Final Four games. And then Championship May 16th. 1, B, 1 p.m. on ABC will be the title game. And so that's kind of fun this time of year. There's no football, there's no XFL uh, this year. There's no spring football at all. So, so to get your football fix, you really have the FCS carrying us through these tough times for, our, for these football fans. So and that'll be fun. FCS football, and I'm not just saying it's because of the Bison because they win and you go there, but these fans are, holy cow, they back their teams, blood, sweat, and tears. They'll die for them. So the fans of these games, for what fans they can have, are very passionate. So that's what makes it more fun, too. It's not just, oh, here's the whatever team going on and the eight people, their, their parents are in the crowd. No, in normal situations, these places are selling out. They're getting a good draw down there all the time for this stuff. So these are passionate fans, which helps the kids, which motivates everybody, which leads to good football. And, and South Dakota State, number one. Oh, uh, they're the number ones. Are they number the number one, one overall seed? But oh, James Madison is. James Madison was the last. They were number one in the final rankings, but uh, the Bunnies got the number one seed. That's so right. They got the number one seed overall. That, if I didn't do a re-ranking after that, that's your seedings, one through four, your top seeds. Um, James Madison is going to be a tough one to watch. The Bunnies, or the, the Jackrabbits, the Bunnies, they're the number one seed. They got kind of a nice draw there too. But, again, that's why you play the games. So we'll see. Now, the other thing that's interesting, Andy, is because there wasn't a full season, some of these teams played a game or two in the fall, had the big layoff, and played more games now in the spring. Some didn't play any in the fall. Some teams are coming into this tournament with a 3-0 and record. Right. They've only played three games all season. So it will be interesting. Now a team like Jacksonville State played 11. They're 9-2. and two. Jacksonville State. Uh, a lot of these teams played five or six games is really all they yeah. played. And there's five, uh, five teams represented from the Missouri Valley Conference playing in the Sweet 16. Um, it's going to be fun to watch. Now – we're seeing the NFL draft coming up. Yep. When, when is the NFL draft, Andy? Uh, um, well, it's coming up in the next couple, next couple of weeks. So yeah, that'll be fun. Due to the – so it's in May. It's, uh, it's on a uh, – well, the draft. Yeah, they have it over multiple days. So Yeah, it's a, week, the, it's a whole week. Yeah. Due, due to the, uh, the pandemic, there's no scouting combines at all. Now they have, uh, you know, pro player days and things like that, but no combine. NFL draft is coming up. I've seen a couple mock drafts. The mock drafts are hot and heavy this time of year. You got Trey Lance uh, projected to go number four overall from the NDSU Bison. Number four. April 29th. Okay. So it starts already this week. Okay. Trey Lance, go for Rashad Bateman, projected in some of these mock drafts, possibly first round, 27th overall pick. Uh, he's a wide receiver from the Gophers. So that'll be fun. We'll cover that next week, along as uh, also with the uh, results of the first round FCS 
football. That'll be you know, good. Not oh, for yeah, baseball. Yeah. Not for baseball. I got one thing to touch on American League baseball. The Twins, like you said, find themselves at the bottom or near the bottom. Yeah. Earlier this week, I think it was uh, on Wednesday or, or Thursday this week, they were actually the last place team in the AL Central. And I think on Wednesday of this week, the Yankees were the worst team in the entire American League at one point. Yep. So, a lot of people down on the Twins. Remember, we got to keep in mind, they faced the Red Sox a week or so ago. Red Sox were on an eight, nine, ten game winning streak. And I think the Twins just got unlucky because they didn't really lose those games. Uh, Red Sox were on a hot streak. They were on a heater there and, and beat up the Twins a three out of four. Now the Twins go to Oakland. Well, and also the Twins in that set, they lost two out of three to Seattle, who was hot at the time, too. So, so the, the, the Twins were playing players. Seattle, who was, who was hot, Red Sox hot, and now they happen to play Oakland. In Oakland, the A's are riding a 12-game winning streak right now, which is almost, I wouldn't say unheard of in baseball, but very rare. Double-digit win streaks are very rare in Major what? League Baseball. And like you said, if you get one of those, put one of those together, play 500 the rest of the year, you're still ending up with about 91 wins yep. on the season. And all you got to do is play 500 the rest of the way. So the A's are, the, are, the, are a team to watch. Twins oh. are the tough luck because they're just getting these teams while they're hot. Uh, if we hang with the it, street. Twins should be okay for the season. But, it's boy, it's frustrating to watch, especially how the Twins are losing some of these games. Right. I was just going to say that. The game against the A's with the, the 11th year old for the A's were two years in that inning. Yes. Fundamental plays. So, like I said, the, the teams that are beating them because they're hot and they're also getting all this karma going their way and they're winning. Now, the Twins also have uh, uh, spectacularly lost some of these wild games. Right. But I think they'll be fine in the, in the long haul, in the long run. Now, last night, Twins come home, play Pittsburgh, and J.A. Happ throws a one-hit shutout. A one-hitter. leaves Through seven innings, yeah. Through seven innings, he had a no-hitter going and uh, <clears throat> gives up a double. Brings in some other – brings in the relief. They shut them down, and Twins get a, a combined uh, – was it a two-hit shutout or a one-hit shutout on the – One hit, Three pitchers, one hitter, yep. One hitter for three pitchers. So um, – and that's J.A. Happ. So that's all I've got on the Twins. The answer – And that's what the Twins need, a good shot in the arm like that to get things going. That is awesome. And and Pittsburgh's uh, not that good, are they? No, they're, they're, they're about 500 team, touch that's below. Fine. But still so, – Coming in, they were better than we were. So it would be nice to get a series, just simply a series win here. A couple of those, string a couple of those along. But they have, they've had some tough luck. So that's why I'm wearing the A's cap today. A shout out to Oakland. Um, boy, they're tough. Uh, answer to the trivia question, once again, was Alabama A&M. So they're the team to place, uh, to take Elkhorn State's place. That's all I've got for, for sports. Are we ready for the album review? The album of the week, sir. Here's what I got for album of the week. 1977 debut album by American rock singer Meatloaf and composer Jim Steinman is the album of the week. Here's the, here's the cover. So this was released in 1977. It was developed from a musical called Neverland, which is a futuristic rock version of Peter Pan, which Steinman wrote in 1974 for a workshop that he was in. <clears throat> So anyway, he wrote it, Bat Out of Hell, uh, one of the best-selling albums of all time, having sold over 50 million, 55 million records worldwide, certified 14 million records, 14 times platinum in the U.S. Length of the album, 46 minutes, 25 seconds, released on October 21st, 1977. Uh, Steinman and Meatloaf had difficulty finding a record company willing to sign them. Now, according to Meatloaf's autobiography, the band spent most of 1975 writing and recording the material and spent two and a half years auditioning the record to record labels and being rejected. Rejected. Two and a half years. I can't even really imagine this, having the record done, putting in all the hard work. Basically, the album was in the can, recorded, ready to go. Yep. So they spent two and a half years trying to audition and being rejected by everybody. They said, no, it's too weird. It's too odd. It's too strange. Kind of like uh, 
Queen trying to put that song Bohemian Rhapsody on the album and the record producer's like, I don't think so. Uh, that's not going to go anywhere. And it becomes their, their biggest hit. Originally, Meatloaf did not want the song Paradise by the Dashboard Lights on the album. One of their biggest, biggest, album, uh, biggest songs in the album, Paradise by the Dashboard Lights. Uh, they had a problems uh, with some of the mixes because they couldn't have enough fillers to fill it in if this song was going to be out. So they threw it back in, Paradise by the Dashboard Lights. Now, for you baseball fans, Paradise by the Dashboard yes. Lights, it's Phil Rizzuto that does the play-by-play. Right. Okay. Yep. Bill Rizzuto does the play-by-play. This was recorded in 1976 at the Hit Factory in New York City by Todd Rundgren. Now he's an he's an Italian Catholic, devout Catholic. Rizzuto publicly maintained that he was unaware that his contribution but but would be equated with sex in the finished song. <laughs> what it is? It's, it, he, he said he did not know that it'd be equated with sex, putting the play-by-play -play of rounding the first base, second base, third place, and coming home. Relating to sex, he said he was unaware. Now, Meatloaf comes back out and asserts later that Rizzuto claimed ignorance only to stifle the criticism, and he himself was fully aware of the content of which he was recording. So Phil Rizzuto and uh, famous baseball announcer there for the for the New York Yankees. Here's the track listings. Now remember, all tracks were written by Jim Steinman and composed. Song one, Bad Out of Hell. Song two, You Took the Words Right Out of My Mouth, also called Hot Summer Night. Song three, Heaven Can Wait. Song four, All Revved Up and No Place to Go. Song five, Two Out of Three Ain't Bad. Now Two Out of Three Ain't Bad, was written by Steinman as a direct response to actress Mimi Kennedy. <laughs> Mimi Kennedy asked Steinman, why can't you just write a simple song like Elvis Presley's, I want you, I need you, and I love you? Simple. Can't you write a simple song? So he wrote it. He said, well, not all three of those, but two out of three ain't bad. Pretty good song. And he has, I want you, I need you, I love you in that song. Yes, it, it's, the, it's the main part of the... Uh, Main part of that song. So that's that's pretty good in response to Mimi Kennedy. Two out of three ain't bad. And then we get Paradise by the Dashboard Light. Now this is an eight minute, 28 second song broken down into three parts. For the newer listeners, it starts off with Paradise. Phase two goes into Let Me Sleep On It. Yep. And then phase three is Praying for the End of Time. Long song. And, you know, Bad Out of Hell at the beginning is nine minutes and 48 seconds long. The uh, that title, title track. And then the album rounds out with song seven for crying out loud, which is also almost nine minutes long. Well, like I said, Paradise by the Dashboard Light, eight, eight plus minutes long. Everybody knows every word to that song. Yes. And remember, they were trying to pitch this album for two and a half years, trying to get a record company to buy it. Now for the cover. Here's the covers on the screen here. Steinman is credited with the album cover concept, which is illustrated by Richard Corbin. The cover depicts a motorcycle written by a long, ridden by a long haired man bursting out of the ground in a graveyard. In the background, a large bat perches atop the mausoleum that towers above the rest of the tombstones. In a 2001 uh, magazine by Q Magazine listed this cover as number 71 in their list of best 100 album covers of all time. So that's the album cover right there, bursting out of the ground. Uh, <clears throat> uh, that, is, that is awesome. Now this album in 1989 by the music magazine Kerrang! lists this album number 38 among the 100 greatest heavy metal albums of all time. Now, Max Weinberg also formerly Bruce Springsteen's E Street Band uh, drummer, uh, plays the drums on song one, two, and six, Max Weinberg. Uh, can you tell us any more about Jim Steinman, Andy? Um, well, I think Max Weinberg was also the drummer for uh, David Letterman. That's right. Okay, so the David Letterman Late Show was, was Max Weinberg, 
and the Weinbergs uh, seven or something like that. And Michael Lee, Michael Lee Day also had something to do with the E Street Band. Uh, Michael Lee Day is also the real name of Meatloaf. Oh yes. Um, and Meatloaf was like a nickname he got like in high school, and it just always kind of stuck. I think we all knew that one guy in high school had a nickname, and he goes somebody else go, what is his real name? You know, so many people just, he was Meatloaf, and it never came up in anything. You know, but uh, he was in Rocky Horror Picture Show. Um, Jim Steinman, I think, had something to do with that, too. Jim Steinman just passed away this last week, too. He, he was kind of like a, he, he could write all the songs, but he wasn't going to be the guy performing it and singing it. Kind of like uh, Elton John and his partner. They just kind of, the two of them just clicked. Him and Meatloaf were kind of like the rock version of that. They did this one album, and then it was 20 some years later for the follow up album, Bad Out of Hell 2. Because Meatloaf went into issues, we'll just say. Again, that, another show for another day on that one. Very talented, both of them. Jim Steinman, I'm sure, has written many a song for other people. The way, like I said, it was a play he'd done, this was based off of. So I have no problem with him plugging his name on the, on the album cover, Songs by Jim Steinman. So that helps sell five more albums, great. You know, um, I just thought there, I saw a lot of documentaries on Meatloaf when the second album came out. You know, everybody was all Meatloaf fans again. And that helped pump the first album sales again, too. Everybody wants to go back and hear that one. Uh, very talented. The rock operas, Styx did them. You know, the rock operas, or, or Tommy from the rock opera Tommy. This was kind of that same genre of type of music. It was kind of popular mid seventies, early eighties, which are okay. It was kind of the precursor to videos. Um, we're not gonna get into Kiss and the Phantom of the Park, uh, Park movie, but it was a step below that without doing a whole movie and having a bomb like that. It is the long songs, kind of like like I said, the rock opera, Tommy rock opera. I really enjoy those a lot. The Meatloaf albums, Tommy. They're great for when you have a long car trip to go on. So you're not hearing like 18 songs over and over and over on your playlist. You put in all these long nine-minute songs, and then we got to take this long trip. Well, geez, that only took 10 songs to get to. That wasn't that bad a trip. It was an hour and a half, two-hour trip, but, you know, it was 10 songs. I think with Meatloaf, um, one thing about the, the song Paradise by the Dashboard Light, um oh boy i'm gonna miss his name now <laughs> robbie benson remember robbie benson from the 80s the actor yes that gal that's a that sings on paradise of the dashboard light that's his wife oh it is still married to this day so a little fun fact there for you that's ellen foley yes mrs robbie benson Ellen Foley, and she, uh, yeah, she does it, and also uh, she's in the music of the video, is, I guess. Yeah, well. very talented singer, um, you know, so those of us our age, kind of, if you don't remember this, go back, look up Robbie Benson later, go, oh, him, yeah. I did not know that. that. Now, Andy, you mentioned the subsequent album, and there was, uh, they came out with the uh, sequel, Bad Out of Hell 2, called Back Into Hell, and then a sequel, Bad Out of Hell 3, The Monster is Loose. Yes. And then a shout out also to the uh, the orchestra that plays on this album was members of the New York Philharmonic and the Philadelphia Orchestra. So that's what I've got this week for album of the week. One of the top albums, great great album cover, um, sold 50 million albums worldwide, uh, and still to this day, I mean, they're still selling. They're still um, out there. So that's what I've got for this. They can probably thank us for 10 more sales after they hear this. Yes, exactly. Anything else? Uh, for today's show, Andy? Uh, no, I just a little programming note. Um, the, my, uh, Fridays for a while, yesterday I did one for the FCS. Every Friday through this playoffs, I'll do a little special football Friday one, probably about five, ten minutes. And on Tuesday, I'm going to kind of give a replug here to the Isaiah Mueller band. I went and saw them last weekend. I did my recap with them. Um, very, very highly recommended you go see them. So. Shouts out to those guys. I did a midweek episode on the Crow River Valley uh, Baseball League as well. Um, they got started last weekend, and there's more games here this weekend. And amateur baseball or town ball 
Uh, it's going to get into full swing here beginning of May for all the leagues, all conferences uh, statewide. But these first early round games are, uh, are fun. You know, the, the, the college kids aren't back on the teams yet who are playing college ball. So you yeah. get to see some of the backups, some of the reserves, some of the high school kids on some of these teams. You also see higher than average errors in these games. Uh, yes. But it is what it is. Get out there and watch the season. See that all over. So, yeah. That's all I've got here for this show. Uh, once again, any um, recommendations for the listeners, for the viewers? Uh, no, just uh, comments, suggestions down below. Like and subscribe on all the fancy buttons or wherever you're listening. Uh, audio or video, if you're listening just on the audio part, great. Thank you. Any suggestions? Let us know for bands uh, you want to do. Uh, we've got the Facebook page, we've got Twitter, Instagram, a blog we do about once a month. We YouTube. update and YouTube here for that. Uh, my shows are on Instagram Tuesday, and the football ones will be on Fridays. Dan's midweek show is on here on the YouTube. All right. Have a good week, everybody. All Thanks right. for listening. Thank you.